Welcome to lecture 5.4 in Math 1324. Today we're going to cover some more on annuities, um, present value, and also amortization. One of the most important things, amortization, are the tables that are created when you buy a car loan, a car or a home. Okay. Today's brief pause before we begin is talking about control. Okay. Control the things you can control. Often we feel that, um, often I feel and have felt that sometimes I'm in situations beyond my control. And it's a nice story I tell myself um, because it um, makes me not feel responsible for where I find myself. But often when I go a little bit deeper, um, there are actions or thoughts things I could have controlled that may have put me in a different place. And so I think it's really important, especially when we're talking about finances, um, and we've done a lot of you know these pauses about finances, but control is major. Control is major about finances. Control is major about um, how you're doing in school um, and about maturing and realizing that you know there are a lot of things that you are in control over um, but you may not be exercising it. What are some of the things we can control? Um, our beliefs, our attitude, our thoughts, our perspective, how honest I am, who my friends are, what books I read, how often I exercise. Um, and I'm going to pause there for a minute because this doesn't mean you have to belong to a gym. One of the healthiest things you can do is just walk out your door and walk for an hour a day. Um, this is going to help your heart, your weight, um, your um, strength and, and stamina, etc. The type of food you eat, how many risks you take, how you interpret situations, how kind you are to others, how kind you are to yourself, a major one. How often you say I love you, how often you say thank you, how you express your feelings, whether or not you ask for help, that was a challenge, that is a challenge for me. How often you practice gratitude, how many times you smile, the amount of effort you put forward, and 21, I don't know why it's 21, how you spend and invest your money, how much time you spend worrying, how often you think about your past, whether or not you judge other people, whether or not you try again after a setback, and how you, much you appreciate the things you are. Um, again, you know, we saw a quote earlier that um, it's not your fault if you're born poor, but it is your fault if you die poor. And that's really about, uh, you know, some of the things we're learning here, but mainly about um, exercising control over those things, exercising control over our spending, exercising control over our saving. Um, you know, I know myself, um, and this had to be pointed out to me, that often um, earlier on when I talked about money, I talked about it as a almost like another person um, that had control over it. Like it was something I didn't control. And my money was like another entity um, that I couldn't figure out how to control. Um, and I realized I was just thinking poorly. Incredible change happens in your life when you decide to take control of what you do, have power over instead of craving control over what you don't. So it's important to recognize that we do have an, um, an incredible amount of control in our life, um, even in the, um, situations where we don't feel like we have a, a lot of control, and you can refer back to that list. But when I do take control, another part of that is taking responsibility for where I am. If I don't have the savings I want, I have two choices. I either cut my, spe cut my spending, so I can save more money or I earn more money by maybe taking a second job. And throughout most of my career, I often did um, side gigs and I even do that now. Success at anything will always come down to this, focus and effort, and we control both. It's true for money. It's true for how well you're gonna do in this class. It's not about having some special um, gene or um, brain cell that does math. It's really about how much time and energy and, and how you focus on your learning here. Again, it's about what you do, not what you can do. If you can learn self-control, 
you can master anything. And I'll leave it with there and we'll move on. So we're going to finish up the take home portion of our test. Um, you need to again do this on a paper copy, um, take photos of it, put it all in one email, preferably in one document if possible, not five separate pictures. Maybe you can cut and paste them into a uh, PDF or something like that that has multiple pages and email that to me um, prior to taking your test. So the first thing we're going to do, and this is a really important one because this is where most of Americans have a huge amount of problems, and that is to um, focus on credit cards. So we're going to complete part five, which is on pages five and six, and this is talking about credit cards. Um, I don't know if this uh, link still works, um, but definitely check out that video. If, if it doesn't, Google Life takes Visa and um, I think Cafeteria. Um, and you'll see this video that I want you to watch because it's, it's really telling about how, uh, again, we're manipulated by marketing and basically the message is cash is bad, credit is king. Okay, look at what's happening uh, based upon income and net worth. Um, who has the most? You would think that um, who has the most credit card debt might be the richest people. Not so true. Um, and then looking at what it costs you. And again, what we're talking about here and what we've been talking about through or what I've been talking about through all of Chapter 5 in regards to financial savvy is stop thinking in terms of monthly budget and monthly payments. You've got to be thinking long term when it comes down to your financial health and success. Um, every time you use your credit card and don't pay off the full balance, you are paying a huge premium. And this exercise, I think, will be really good to show you how much that $4 cup of Starbucks costs, how much that $40 trip to the restaurant or bar will eventually cost you. You know, that nice dinner you had with your friends, maybe over $100. That's a fancy freaking meal. Do you really want to spend that at Chili's? Um, and really, that's what it's costing you when you don't pay off your credit cards. And, you know, I'm not preaching at you because I'm so smart. Well, I am, but no, I'm just kidding. I'm preaching at you because I screwed this up for a long, long, long time. And part of that was my thinking. I used to say or, you know, say to myself, you know, I work hard and I worked hard in college. I had jobs, etc. I deserve rewards. Well, that may be true, but I wasn't necessarily just giving myself a reward. I was penalizing myself. I was fining my future pay. And so that reward cost so much more than it was really worth to me. And that story that I kept telling myself, I deserve this today because I work hard, was just a false story. I wasn't really, uh, I didn't do the work to figure out what it really was costing me financially if I only paid the minimum. And truthfully, at that time, uh, many years ago, you didn't have this credit card report. Now it shows you, when you get your credit card statement, it shows you what it's going to cost you if you just pay the minimum balance, not only in dollars, but how long it's going to um, take to pay it off. In this example, I can read that it's going to take 17 years to pay off this $3,000 balance um, if I only pay the minimum payment every month. And that's if I don't charge anything new. So this is really powerful. I hope this is a great learning experience for you around credit cards. And then also we're going to complete um, part six. Another really key thing about student loans. Student loans are... Um, again, another place where banks manipulate you um, to take out money and it feels like free money. And especially I know for me when I would get student loans, man, you know, it was very rare that I'd get a, a thousand dollar check or even a five hundred dollar check at that point in my life. So to get a check for two thousand dollars, damn, I hit the lotto. And so it, it was this great emotional high. I was really happy, excited, and I often went out and treated myself to things that that money was not meant for. And, um, and so I rewarded myself, but I didn't really because that reward had too much of a anchor or um, punishment, really, um, for me to actually pay that back. Okay, 
So um, a big key here is students um, not figuring out how much they should borrow, et cetera. I have a friend when I was finishing my master's in philosophy and mathematics who was getting her doctorate in philosophy and had over $100,000 in student loans. Well, a doctorate in philosophy is basically, um, you know, you're qualified to teach. And so having $100,000 in loans as a teaching job is not probably the best thing. So one of the things you're going to do here is look at the target, like what you should be spending or what you, excuse me, what you should borrow in a student loans. Like what are some parameters? So, you know, a good parameter that I say, and, and not just me, and that is in this assignment is that um, see, and you did this for your home loan, what do you think you're going to be making when you finish your college degree and start in your field of study, if you're an accountant or you're a biologist, et cetera, figure out what that annual salary is. So let's say it's 60,000. Divide that by half. That's your target. So if you're going to start out at a job making 60,000, you should not have more than 30. You should target to not have more than 30,000 in loans. That's where you want to keep it. Now, if you need the money and you don't have the resources to finish college, then you can go above that target, but never, never, ever go above one year salary. So for example, again, that example where you're going to make 60,000 to start, or that's your projection, your goal is to not borrow more than 30, but your absolute stopping point is you cannot borrow more than 60,000. Why? Because it's going to really inhibit your ability to pay for the next 10 years. Student loans have to be paid off in 10 years. And if you borrow too much money, it's really going to impact your life at the point where it's really starting. I mean, like it was so exciting for me to get, you know, to go from being a waiter to working in corporate America and, and getting that big salary paycheck at the time. It's probably embarrassing, but I remember when I made 24000 which roughly is about $12 an hour, um, was my first corporate job. But I was so excited. Before that, minimum wage was about $4. So I had tripled my pay, um, and this was a regular pay. Okay? So look at this activity. This is really important to you right now, so you can figure out um, should you borrow money. And, and Education is a perfect thing to borrow money for. It's probably the best thing to borrow money for because it can pay back if you're mature enough to take it seriously, um, to put your time and energy in to get good grades, and to move forward in your career and do the other things necessary. But you got to know where the targets are, okay? 50% is your target. 100% is your absolute stopping point of your annual pay. And then the last part is I just want to hear what you thought about this exercise, what you learned what was um, you know, really powerful for you, et cetera. I honestly believe that this section, this chapter five, could be one of the most um, important two weeks of your college and life career, classes for college, because there's such powerful learning in this document. So I hope you took it very seriously and not just you know, did it because it's part of the test, um, although I, I understand that motivation as well. All right. So Let's finish up our chapter five. This is a fast chapter. This is our last section. Annuities. In the annuities studied previously, regular deposits were made into an interest-bearing account, and the value of the annuity increased from zero at the beginning to some larger amount at the end, the future value. Okay. Now we're going to expand the discussion to include annuities that begin with an amount of money and make regular payments each period until that value of, my, of annuity decreases to zero. So what we're talking about is um, you might win the lottery. Okay, well, event, you know, you, you've won some lump sum of money. Most people take that, not everyone, but a lot of people take that in annual payments. So an annuity, you get money each year for 20, 30 years, etc., until that money runs out. Oftentimes when, a, um, when someone um, sues somebody else, um, the payments that are made, like let's say you get a settlement, like you know you're in a car accident and the and the trucking company that hit you has to pay you money. A lot of times um, that payment will be in the form of an annuity. Instead of getting a hundred thousand dollars, maybe you get um, five, you know, a couple thousand dollars every month for twenty years or something like that. Um, and just any kind of loan, you know, when you borrow money to buy a house, when you borrow money to buy a car, 
when you borrow money at rooms to go to buy a living room suit or a bedroom suit, right? Technically, what you're doing is you're borrowing a lump sum, the present value. Let's say it's a $20,000 car. Well, that $20,000 is your present value, right? Because that's what you borrowed. And then you're making payments down to the future value, which will be zero. And that's what this is called, talking about. And, and I mentioned it in a previous lecture. In 5.2, we saw that the present value of A amount of dollars at the interest I per period for N periods is the amount that must be deposited today at the same interest rate in order to produce A dollars in N periods, okay? So this is just saying how much money do we need um, to, to make those payments over the same amount of time as the present value we have to put in today to get to that same future value, if you will. Similarly, the present value of an annuity is the amount that must be deposited today at the same compound interest rate as the annuity to provide all payments for the term of the annuity. It does not matter whether payments are invested to accumulate funds or are paid out to disperse funds. The amount needed to provide the payments is the same in either case. Okay, this may be a lot of words, but I think the examples will actually help you. And it might have been better if I did an example first, but you can come back here if you need to. Your rich aunt has funded an annuity that will pay you $1,500 at the end of each year for six years. If the interest rate is 8% compounded annually, find the present value of this annuity. This is a simple question because it's very clear that what you're trying to find is the present value. It gives you a payment amount, it gives you the interest rate, and it tells you that it's compounded annually. So we can plug this into our TVM solver. <clears throat> And of course, it's um, six years, it's compounded annually, so we can multiply by one. The interest rate is eight, we divide by one. Um, we're looking for the present value, we know the payment is 1500, and we know the future value is zero. She's creating a fund that she's going to pay you so much money for six years, so at the end, the amount and that money in that account should be zero. Okay? If you plug this in, um, hopefully by now you know how to use the TVM solver, you should get $6,934, okay? Now again, remember that um, you, this, whether it's the end or the beginning, you have to pay attention to what's happening in the problem. And this tells us that we're being paid at the end of each year. Again, I, I wanna show you the formula that you can use. Um, a lot of students, well, not a lot, but a few students prefer working with formulas and you will get the same answer um, using the present value of an ordinary annuity is given by this, okay? Example two, Jim Riles was in an auto accident. He sued the person at fault and was awarded a structured settlement, that's what it's called, a structured settlement, in which an insurance company will pay him $600 at the end of each month for the next seven years. How much money should the insurance company invest now at 4.7% compounded monthly to guarantee that all payments can be made? Well, it's asking you how much money now. So we know again, this is a present value because now is the present, right? So when we look at this problem, again, remember we gotta pay attention to whether it's when we're getting paid at the beginning of the month or the end of the month, et cetera, for that bottom part of the TVM solver. Again, it's 7%, um, it's compounded monthly, so it's seven times 12, seven years times 12 um, periods that it's compounded. The interest rate is 4.7 divided by the number of compounds per year. We're looking for the present value. We know the payment is $600 and the future value, the money will be zero at the end, okay? And uh, at the end, and then of course, because they're paying us at the end of each month, we need to make sure that end is highlighted in the bottom, and you should get this amount, $42,877.44. Let's look at example three. To supplement his pension in the early years of his retirement, Ralph Taylor plans to use $124,500 of his savings as an ordinary annuity that will make monthly payments to him for 20 years. If the interest rate is 5.2%, how much will each payment be made? how much will each payment be excuse me all right again here we need to figure out most of this we know we're looking for the payment amount 
uh, we know that n is going to be 20 years. Uh, let's see, how often is it compounded? It's making monthly payments. It doesn't say how often it's compounded, but when the period of the payment is what we're going to use for the compounding. So it's going to be 20 um, times 12. The interest rate is going to be 5.2 divided by 12. The present value is the money he's putting into the account. The payment is what we're looking for, and at the end, it should be zero. Okay. Of course, this is an ordinary annuity, and does that mean beginning or end? Do you remember? What is an ordinary annuity? Is it paid at the beginning of each cycle or at the end of each cycle? It's paid at the end. So we plug all these numbers in, we use our TVM solver, and what um, Ralph should be getting is a payment for $835. Um, every month um, over the next 20 years. Okay? Let's look at another example. This is a confusing one. Surrender Sina and Maria Gonzalez are graduates of Kenyon College. They both agree to contribute to an endowment fund at the college. Sina says he will give 500 at the end of each year for nine years. Gonzalez prefers to give a single gift donation today. How much should she give to equal the value of Sinai's gift, assuming that the endowment fund earns 7.5% interest compounded annually? Okay, so we can do this a couple ways. We came that for Gonzalez to equal this contribution, she should contribute today an amount equal to the present value of the annuity. She needs, kind of like the rich aunt, right? The money she needs to put in today needs to be able to fund these payments over the next nine years at this compounded interest. It's not any different from that, although it seems a little bit confusing, okay? We also know it's at the end because it's, it, um, he's giving money at the end of each year. Um, it's compounded annually, so it's nine years times one, the interest rate divided by one. We're trying to figure out the present value, what, set, what Maria should give that will equal making these $500 payments for the next nine years. Okay, $3,189.44. All right, so again, in order for her to make an equal um, contribution, she needs to be able to fund, put money in today that will fund these payments that he's making over um, the next nine years, okay? Notice bottom line, he's giving $4,500. 500 times nine is $4,500. She's giving um, 3,189 today that will equal that same 4,500 for the school. So she's actually saving money by putting it all in today, and that's the time value of money. The present value of an annuity for accumulating funds is the single deposit that would have to be made today to produce the future value of the annuity. And that's just describing what we just saw. The present value of an annuity for accumulating funds is the single deposit that you'd make today that would make all those payments, that would cover all those payments. A 15-year $10,000 bond with a 5% coupon rate was issued five years ago and is now being sold, okay? So we've got a 15-year $10,000 bond. It's five years old, so it's got 10 years left. If the current interest rate for similar bonds is 7%, what should the purchaser be willing to pay for this bond, okay? So because the interest rate has changed, we want to use the new interest rate. Why would an investor um, pay, uh, buy a 5% bond when a 7% bond is now available. So we need to calculate based upon the 7%. Now remember that a corporate bond, excuse me, a coupon bond, not only pays you this $10,000 at the end, the face value, the 10,000, so at the end of 15 years, at the end of 10 now, because five have passed, you're going to get a check or the owner's going to get a check for $10,000, the face value or the maturity value. But also remember, a coupon bond pays you this um, interest rate every six months. Okay, so you get a check every six months um, based upon 
percent of this ten thousand dollar bond and then at the end of the whole bond cycle when the bond matures you're going to get a ten thousand dollar check okay so first we need to figure out what the payments are well remember that the payments this is a simple interest right we need these interest payments so it's ten thousand dollars times five percent times one half why one half because it's paid every six um, every six months, which is half of a year. Remember, time is in years. So each payment is going to be $250, okay? So going back to our last example, this purchaser needs to figure out how much money they should put in um, to an account to make these um, $250 payments every six months for the next 10 years. Why 10? Again, it was 15 years and we've already passed five. So that's the first part that we're gonna do. Think of the bond as a two-part investment. The first is the annuity that pays 250 every six months for the next 10 years at the 7% interest. I'm not gonna go through these steps, but we're looking for the present value. I'm gonna pay today what's gonna pay me out $250 in payments um, every six months for the next 10 years, okay? So compounded semi-annually, so 10 years times two because we're getting every six months. The interest rate is divided by two because it's compounded semi-annually and we're looking for the present value. And so I should be willing to pay um, $3,553.10 for those $250 payments I'm gonna get every six months. Now think about it, I'm getting $500 a year for 10 years so I'm going to get $5,000. I'm going to pay $35.53 today to get that $5,000 at 7% interest over the next 10 years. Okay, so this is a good investment. 7% is pretty good. The second is, what should I be willing to pay today at that same interest rate to get a cash payout of $10,000 at the end? Okay. So this isn't about an annuity at the second part. This is just what we did, I think, in 5.1 and 5.2. How much should I pay today to get $10,000 in 10 years at 7% interest compounded um, semi-annually every six months? Again, we have the same kind of calculation. It's 10 um, times 2 because it's compounded semi-annually. Um, 7 divided by 2 because it's compounded semi-annually. Coupons are done that because coupons pay out every six months. That's when the compounding happens. We're looking for the present value um, that's going to give us a future value of $10,000. What should I pay today? What should I invest today to get this $10,000? Again, there are no payments now. Um, I'm just going to pay one lump sum. And so when I do this, I get $5,025.66. Okay, so the total that I should be willing to pay for this bond is the combination or the sum of the amount I pay for the payments and the amount I pay for the check at the end. And that's pretty nice. I pay 5000 today and, and I'm going to get double that in 10 years. What we saw about banking, I'm certainly never going to get that in a savings account. Remember that 6000 F in years? All right, let's move on. So the total I should be willing to pay today or a purchaser should be willing to pay is the sum of these two numbers. $35.53 and $5,025, okay? What is this person totally getting in receipt for that $8,578 investment? Well, remember, they're getting a $10,000 bond at the end and then the result of 10 years of these payments. So they're actually earning $15,000. So they're almost getting a double, you know, they're not quite double, but they're almost doubling their money in 10 years. And that's not a bad investment. That's a pretty damn good investment. You don't see bonds anymore. Uh, maybe um, corporate bonds or something, but I don't know what kind of bond would have a 5% rate or even a 7% rate. That's wonderful. I'd be buying some of those suckers myself. All right, we're almost done here. If you take out a car loan or a home mortgage, you repay it by making regular payments to the bank. From the bank's point of view, your payments are an annuity that is paying it at a fixed amount each month. The present value of this annuity is the amount you borrowed. Again, you need to get that. You buy a car for $20,000, you owe the bank $20,000 today, and then you start making payments. So let's look at an example just like that. Chase Bank in April 2013 advertised a new car auto loan rate of 2.23% 
for a 48-month loan. Shelly Fusulko will buy a new car for $25,000 with a down payment of $4,500. Find the amount of each payment. Again, we're going to go back to our TVM solver. How much money? Um, we know that the number of payments is 48 payments. Um, well, that's just a 48. It's a four-year loan. or they, they already gave it in months. So it's four years times 12 because it's compounded monthly because you're making payments monthly. The interest rate is 2.23 divided by 12, again, because you're making monthly payments. The present value is the amount that you're borrowing for the car. The payment is what we're trying to find out. What's the future value going to be? Do you know? Well, what would be the, the amount that you owe on your loan after you've paid it off? Zero. Okay. Now, wait. Why did we not put $25,000 in for the present value? Because Shelly made a down payment. So she gave them $4,500 cash when she took out this loan. So she only owes the bank $25,000 minus the down payment, or $20,500. When we plug this in, we get a payment of $446.81. Hopefully by now you realize that um, buying a car is a much wiser investment than leasing a car. Um, you, you need to be, honestly, you need to be incredibly rich where money doesn't matter for it to make sense to lease a car. The fact that you can just throw money away. A car, it doesn't make any sense to rent the most expensive item in your budget. That's why buying a house and buying a car um, are pretty good ideas as long as you keep a hold of them um, for longer than five, 10 years. And cars you really, well, I'm not gonna go there. You've already done the exercise. A loan is amortized if both the principal and interest are paid by a sequence of equal periodic payments. That's what amortization means. Same payment every month. It sounds almost the same as, as um, an annuity, but we say a, basically a loan is amortized if it's based on an annuity. Same payment, same period. Okay. In April 2013, the average rate for a 30-year fixed mortgage was 3.43%. Assume a down payment of 20% on a home purchase of $272,900. Find the monthly payment needed to amortize this loan. Very simple problem. We've got a 30-year loan. Um, so it's 30 um, times 12, right? Because we're paying monthly. Find the monthly payment. The interest rate is 3.43 divided by 12. The present value, if we're paying down 20%, that means we still owe 80% of that. And you can actually plug the formula in here, 0 0.8 times 272,900, and it'll calculate that for you. You don't have to do a separate calculation, write it down, and then put it in the TVM solver. We're trying to find the payment. And of course, the money you owe on your home at the end um, will be zero because you've paid off your home loan. And so I've, I've entered it in the present value, just as you can enter in your calculator on all of these fields, you can do a calculation in that um, field. And so we get a payment of $971.84. Okay. <clears throat> After 10 years, approximately how much is owed on the mortgage? Now, you might be tempted to say, well, 10 years is one third of that. So I'm just going to multiply um, this by two thirds because we've paid off a third and um, two thirds will be left. It doesn't work that way um, because you're paying a large, all your interest you're paying up front. You're paying a, imagine you're borrowing 200, over $200,000 at a 3% interest. That's a lot of money every year. So your payments on the front end um, like when you make your first payment for a house, let's at $971, this is going to shock you, but probably maybe $30, $50 will pay down the principal, will pay down the loan and $900 will go to pay your interest. And slowly that moves the other way. Now it's interesting. My, you know, um, my father always had this strategy where when you buy a home, you get um, you get a listing of every payment and it'll say payment number one and it'll say, you know, 971.84 and then it'll say interest 
um, $920. Um, principal, $51, okay? It'll break down the payment. And what my dad said, um, what his strategy was, is he would look at that amortization table and he would pay the 971 for his first payment and he would simply add in the principal from the second payment, which was $50, et cetera, and he would add that in, and that took care of technically two payments because he's already removed the interest, or excuse me, the principal that you're getting charged interest for. And that's easy to do on the front end because you're only adding an extra $50. Another thing you can do, and I, and, um, I talk about this in the take-home assignment, is just pay 10% more, okay? If you pay 10% more, that would be adding $97 to this payment. If you pay 10% more on every payment on a 30-year loan, your loan goes from 30 years down to 18. You've taken off more than a decade of payments, okay? You've taken off a, a crap load of interest, okay? One of the things you might want to think about here is, um, I want to do this calculation really quickly, is before we go into this problem, I want to do a quick calculation for you. How much are you actually, if you pay this loan off in 30 years at $971, how much do you think you're going to pay for this house that originally cost $272,900? Well, the 272,900, you put down 20%, so you've already paid 54,580. That's 24, 20%. So you've already gave them $54,000 in cash, all right, that you've already started paying for this house, okay? Now you've got 30 years of payments at $971.84. So that's 30 years and 12 payments a year, your payments for this house, just the payments alone, are gonna be $349,862. So just the payment portion, for this $272,000 house, you're paying 300, basically $350,000. And then if we add back in the down payment, you are paying $404,000 for this house, okay? Most people, especially early on, and I never realized this, is how much you're gonna pay um, for your home above the, the asking price. So this, you know, you're paying, this is a quarter million dollar house, and you're paying upward of a half a million dollars. You're moving towards close to half a million dollars, 400,000 really. OK, so I just want you to get that. And that's why it's important in my mind or, or very important for you to really take your emotions out of this and think through when you buy a home, what can you afford? What do you want to afford? Um, do you really want to be connected to a home for 30 years where that may um, make vacations difficult, etc.? Imagine this 900. This is almost a thousand dollars a month. Imagine you pay this off in 15 years, then you have 15 years of $1,000 a month extra to spend. Think about that. That's $12,000 a year. What could you do on $12,000 a year that you're not putting it into your home? Pretty powerful stuff to change your emotionality of, oh, I really want this house, etc. Okay. All right. Now back to our problems. So, uh, it's not two thirds left. We can't say that it doesn't work out easily. What you want to do is to find the present value needed to fund the remaining payments. And this will tell you the balance that's left on your mortgage. So we know what the payments are. We know um, how long is it? 10 years have um, 10 years have passed. So we're going to have 20 years of payments left. So we have 20 years of payments, 20 times 12, because there's 12 payments a year, the same interest rate. Um, we know the payment, it's gonna be paid at zero. So if we find the present value to make the rest of the payments, that will give us our balance. So after 10 years, we still owe $168,000 of the loan that was originally about um, 220. So we've taken off 
about 50,000 in the first 10 years. We've only taken off a quarter in the first 10 years. All right, one more problem. The Illinois Lottery Winners Handbook discusses the options of how to receive winnings for a 12 million lotto jackpot. One option is to take 26 annual payments of approximately $461,538.46, which is simply 12 million divided into 26 equal payments. The other option is to take a lump sum payment, which is often called the cash value. If the Illinois Lottery Commission can earn 4.88% annual interest, how much is the cash value, okay? So again, we're gonna find the present value needed to fund all of these payments. We're making 26 payments um, of this amount uh, each, you know, we're making one of those payments each year. So it's compounded annually. So we get 26 times one, the interest rate is divided by one because it's payments once a year. Um, we're looking for the present value what it's worth today, they could give me a lump sum. And this is how you get the cash value on your ticket when you see if you've ever bought a lottery ticket to make these payments. And of course, at the end, they owe you nothing. There's nothing left in that account. Why, though, do we use beginning and not an ordinary annuity? Why do you think? Well, think about it. You just want a lottery check or a lottery ticket or a lottery prize. Are you gonna wait till the end of the year before they pay you? Hell no, then they're earning all the interest. So lotteries are always paid out as an annuity due um, because you want your money, right? You want your money today. I'm not gonna wait a year. That'd be, can you imagine that? I just won $26 million or $12 million and I gotta wait a year to get it? That'd be crazy. My credit card bills would be crazy. Anyway, um, so we plug this in and we get, um, if we took cash today instead of the payments, we would get a, a check from the lottery for $7,045,397.39. And again, if you've ever bought a lottery ticket, this calculation is done for you. Um, in this problem, it gave us the um, annual payment, but what would you do um, if it's not given? It actually tells you in the problem. How did they get this payment? They simply took the prize, 12 million, and divided by the number of payments. So some problems won't give you that payment amount. Just take the prize and divide by the number of payments there would be. All right, that's the end of our lecture. That's the end of chapter five. I know this has been a bit long, but it, to me, I hope these lectures, I know they're tough to listen to for 45 minutes, um, but hopefully this has made a difference in not only in this chapter and how well you'll do here and on your job in business or wherever you go, but even more so in your life. Um, and hopefully the quarter million dollars that I would be richer will make you richer. By the way, you can give me a small tithe of 10% and um, email me and I'll let you know how to do that. Just kidding. Um, good luck on this and um, reach out if you need anything.